गुड इवनिंग एंड थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस टुडे आई अमित सक्सेना अलोंग विद माय टीम में डॉक्टर दीपिका चावड़ा फ्रॉम मेडिकल सर्विसेज डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जैक्सन पॉल फार्मास्यूटिकल्स वुड लाइक टू एक्सटेंड अ वार्म वेलकम टू ऑल दोस हैव अटेंडेड दो और हु हैज जॉइंड दिस एनआईजीएफ एकेडमी सीरीज ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय नॉर्थ इंडिया गायनेकोलॉजी फोरम विद टेक्निकल पार्टनर जैक्सन पॉल फार्मा मेकर्स ऑफ डिवाट्रोन 10 मिलीग्राम ऑफ टैबलेट ऑफ डाइजेस्ट्रोन we thank you all for this opportunity to connect with you today through this webinar and proud to present divatron 10 mg tablet fully indigenized micronized digestion the only brand having 36 months of shelf life jackson power would like to express gratitude and extend a warm welcome to all the experts and attendees the facebook link of today's webinar is posted on the chat box you may share the link on your whatsapp group for the others to join and watch live of this event NIGF Academy series organized by Dr Sadhana Gupta and we now request Dr Mandana Gupta madam to kindly initiate this webinar this series thank you thank you dr amit and dr deepika so uh, welcome everybody to a very important evening of NIGF Academia series we'll be discussing a very pertinent topic of rh negative pregnancy how to take care So let us have an opening statement by our president, Dr. Sadhana Gupta. Uh, thank you, Varna. Uh, a warm welcome to everyone on the board. And it is a yet another uh, North India Academy or Academy series where we are dealing very, very pertinent topic related to obstetrics and gynecology. So uh, North India Academy Forum is a brainchild of Madam Sh. and uh, she thought of you uh, like being together for all eight states and the two union territories of the north india that obstetrician and gynecologists need to be together unity we have to work for creating the culture of excellence and service together and we have to know each and every obstetrician gynecologist right from the post graduate level to the very senior and the veterans in a short span of almost one year come a long way with a series of excellent academias webinars with a very very good attendance we have the mission for next two year that is the anemia free india cervical cancer free india and preventing preventable mortality from postpartum hemorrhage beside this we have created with a great effort of dr sharda jain and dr sangeeta gupta who is the co chair of nigf how to sensitize every obstetrician and gynecologist that they have a clear knowledge about the examination of a victim of a sexual assault all these academic material is available on nigf web page that is www.nigf in you can register for north india gyne forum and we look forward to a great future together because we can do a lot together so with this a warm welcome to everyone who has come to today this uh, academic series we have a galaxy of experts in the subject on rh negative it is incompatibility it is beyond incompatibility and it is in a part of our mission of anemia free india because anemia starts in utero into the fetus rh negative women with anemic have a different issue and a complicated issue when they are anemic and rh negative and obstetrician and the family members are worried and today with a galaxy of experts dr aparna k sharma dr our all expert dr kishore dr anupam gupta dr arti lutra everyone and the the panel discussion by dr mala shivastav and dr tina we have taken the experts from all the seven and eight states and from the big cities to the small town because there are issues also and uh, there is a lot of gaps in the healthcare between in different regions and the uh, towns and the cities so with this it is a great pleasure to have uh, dr amita suneja as a chief guest for this webinar and uh, vanda can i have cv of madam Uh, Dr. Amita Suneja, a wonderful person. She is a director, professor, and head of the department of Sydney UCMS and Guru Tegh Bahadur Hospital, Delhi, India. She is at present president of Association of OB Gynae of the Delhi, and her special field of interest is gynecological oncology, urogynecology, and adolescent gynecology. Uh, she is president of OGD, chairperson oncology committee OGD from two zero one eight to two zero two zero, and has been the president Narchi Delhi in two zero one four to two zero sixteen. 
Her major achievement is the WHO Fellowship in Gynae Oncology in MD Anderson Hospital, Best Doctor, Teachers of Teachers, Award of Excellence in Adolescent Health, Corona Warrior Award, Appreciation Award, EOGD, Eminent Health and Education Teacher Award. A lot of publication guest lectures, and she has edited uh, three books to her credit. Uh, a warm welcome uh, on the behalf of North India Gaini Forum, Dr. Amita Suzena, Suneja, and we look forward for your uh, like uh, blessings, your uh, thought process, and uh, your good wishes for NIGF as well as the Academia series. Uh, warm welcome, Dr. Amita Suneja. Thank you so much for the kind words and the very elaborative introduction. Thank you. And uh, dear doc and respected Dr. Sharda Jain, and uh, she's a patron and NIGF, Dr. Sadhana Gupta, President NIGF. I can see many vice presidents here and uh, the office bills. And esteemed faculty for today's CME and dear friends. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here. And I thank everybody for inviting me and giving this honor. And, uh, you know, not the India Gaini Forum has created vibrations. It's because it is a vibrant body, dynamic body, and very academic body. And your NIGF Academia series, I congratulate you that have been you're carrying out regularly on very relevant uh, topics. And uh, for today's, the topic is uh, RH negative, which is of great relevance. And you did say that your um, one of the mission is to make India free from in utero to till uh, uh, end of life. So we, uh, and uh, RH negative, you know, this is seed. So we have to take care of it. Although with introduction of NTD, uh, RH isomerization and hemolytic disease of newborn has decreased, but still the challenge is there. The problem is there. And what are the challenges and how to handle with it? I'm esteemed faculty. I know the ground. They have vast experience in this field. They are going to discuss it, and uh, delegates are going to be enriched by end of it. Now, under the able guidance of uh, Dr. Sharda Jain, I always tell, ma'am, you are leader of leaders, and uh, so I'm sure in, if she has thought it, it will be done. India will be anemia mukt and cancer service mukt, along with other whatever objectives we have. And uh, so my all the wishes for today's CME. So uh, have a great success and thank you for inviting me. And uh, I take this opportunity as a president of AOGD to announce that now this time we are doing uh, annual conference in August. Normally we do it in November. It is 18 to 20th August. We have combined it with Foxy PG conference. So it is a combined effort, whole Delhi is doing uh, this conference. So please block your dates from 18 to 20th August and it will be a good show and you have to participate it. Then only it can be a combined effort. So my all blessings and wishes and uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. All the best. Thank you, Dr. Amita. And uh, we will, Dr. Meera Agnihotri is with us. So Dr. Sharda Jain, uh, a few words from Dr. Sharda Jain and Dr. Meera Agnihotri before we just start the scientific session. I think my uh, after Dr. Uh, Amita has spoken, there is nothing has been left uh, for me to say, except mm -hmm. that uh, I wish you, Sadna, very great. Under your leadership, uh, NIGF is, uh, as Madam just now said, Amita is blossoming. And uh, we should see to it that uh, it blossoms much more and your missions for the next two years uh, are definitely taken care of. So all the best wishes for today's uh, webinar. Thank you, Madam. Dr. Meera Agniotri is with us, Madam. Uh, Dr. Meera Agniotri, if she can, we can have her word. If not, then Vanna, you go ahead with the session. Okay. Uh, Madam Meera Agniotri, please, can you no. She's, please unmute yourself to say a few words to us. She's not there. So we are starting with the session. We can invite her later on if she's there. So we are starting on the theme of uh, care of an Irish negative mother. So oh, uh, the session one is a keynote address on RH compatibility, key management issues. Our speaker is none other than Dr. Aparna K. Uh, Sharma from All India. And uh, our experts are Dr. Kishore Rajurkar, 
he's an ex HOD OBGYN and uh, he has been a uh, chairperson of PCPNDT and part of many scientific programs. Welcome, Dr. Rajurkar. Dr. Arshna Verma, who has been uh, passionate about creating awareness of women health, and she has been Vice President Foxy 2021. Welcome, Dr. Archana. Then Dr. Arthi Luthra, uh, junior from my alumnus uh, Agra Medical College and running a Luthra Maternity and Infertility Center in Dehradun and has been awarded uh, by Foxy Achievers Award, Champion of SR, Outstanding Daughter of Uttarakhand, Prathama Award, Gold Medal for Best Paper Presentation and Times Health Icon Award. Anupam Gupta, another alumnus from my uh, Agra Medical College. He has uh, he's been a chapter a chairman for UP chapter of ISAR, President uh, Agra OBGYN Society and Vice President Foxy 2015. Welcome, Dr. Anupam. So Dr. Aparna Sharma, she has been an additional professor, Division of Medicinal Fetal Medicine, a very good orator, a wonderful uh, speaker, I won't, and she has been decorated with many, many awards and medals. Welcome, Dr. Aparna. I won't be standing between you and your important talk. So I'm stopping to share right now. A very good evening to all of you. Uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Sharda Jain, ma'am, uh, Dr. Sadhna Gupta, ma'am. And I'm really happy to be here today talking about one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard my have heard me speak before on this topic. So, uh, you know, if you have some queries on it, most welcome to put put it uh, in the chat, and uh, you know we can take this up later. So, I will start off by talking about the uh, RH incompatibility. Uh, I think uh, RH incompatibility is one of my favorite topics, also because. You know, this is something that has worked over the years. It is something which is so successful because the therapy is one of the earliest, easiest, most widely used, most successful fetal intervention. Uh, and, you know, the, one of the e easiest way to understand this problem is that we simply ask a few questions. Yes, so essentially we need to understand that, you know, when we talk about fetal anemia, we are here talking about the immune fetal anemia, but increasingly with the uh, you know, prevalence of ultrasound, we do come across a lot of cases where we have non-immune fetal anemias also. And one of the very interesting things that we are increasingly trying to manage is the non-immune fetal anemias. And an important practice that we have to increasingly adopt is doing ICTs even for, you know, a positive blood group. So that is something which has been advocated for a long time, even by the RCOG guidelines. So because, you know, you can have an immune anemia even with an RH positive blood group. When we talk about the blood group system, we know that the most common are A, B, o, a, B and O. And we, when we talk about positive blood group, we are just talking about the D, anti-D. So it is either D positive or D negative. But what we don't talk about is the multitude of other antibodies like C, E, K, J, K, F, Y, M, N, S. And now routinely our blood bank looks for other atypical antibodies when they screen for blood. So more and more women are now being de de detected with atypical antibodies. And that is the reason why the ICT could be positive even in an RH positive mother, RHD positive mother because of the presence of atypical antibodies. So the alloimmunization is much more than D and increasingly with the prevalence of, you know, giving anti-Ds, we will have more cases where you have other causes of alloimmunization beyond D. Now, a status check about rhesus alloimmunization. I would say it is one of the most obliging afflictions. And why is that so? Because it can be prevented by giving anti-D. And even if it is, you know, you have not given anti-D and the baby has become affected, we can detect an early affection by giving MC, by doing MCA PSV. Even if after doing MCA PSV, the baby has become anemic, you can de de detect it. You can treat it by giving IUT. So nothing really justifies a fetal or a neonatal loss to this condition. And hence, we have to be aware at all times. And yet we do almost 100 transfusions, intrauterine transfusions in an year. So that really speaks that somewhere we are going seriously wrong in managing this condition. 
So we really need to brush up our, you know, going back, where are we going wrong and ask some basic questions again. So why does this happen? A simple answer that when there is an RH D negative mother who's carrying a D positive baby, the D positive antigens are entering the mother. So when it is a first pregnancy, so in the first pregnancy, what is happening? The DA positive antigens are entering the mother, but they are being cleared by the macrophages and the first immune response is IgM and it does not cross the placenta. So the first baby is not affected. But if the second baby is also RH positive, so this time again, once the antigens are entering, this time, however, it is IgG antibodies and this IgG antibodies can cross the placenta and there is destruction. So typically when we take that history, we know that the previous, you had, they generally have one child who's okay. The first one is usually okay, unless unfortunately they had some obstetric accident and the, that baby is also not alive. So the first baby is usually unaffected and subsequently, because the anti-D was not given, the subsequent babies start getting affected. So what is happening? Antigen-antibody reactions on RBC surface, hemolysis, anemia, hepatic dysfunction, heart failure, erythroblastosis, fetalis, high drops, IUD, polyhydrin loss. While the baby after birth will continue to have hemolysis, jaundice, carnitrous, and neonatal death. So these are the consequences of simple of a RH negative mother carrying an RH positive baby and resultant hemolysis. How big is the problem? So if we don't do anything, we end up with a chance of around 13 to 16%. If we give only postpartum, the risk is one to 2%. If we give anti and postpartum both, then the risk is 0.2%. So really in the third world, or if we talk about the first and the second world, if we are giving good antenatal care, we are going, giving good postnatal care, really the chances are quite low that the RH isoimmunization can happen. But truly speaking, increasingly there are women who are coming with a good socioeconomic background getting RH isoimmunized. And I get referrals all the time with anti-D getting positive. So we really need to look into the reasons why they are getting positive. Maybe the dose is not enough, maybe the timing is not enough, maybe the cold chain was not maintained, or maybe the anti-D was, was monoclonal, it was not polyclonal. So, and it was not given in the deltoid, it was given in the deltoid, uh, not given in the deltoid. So we need to give it on time, give it in the correct place, and give it in the adequate dose. So now, coming to the basic of RH negative pregnancy, simple thing, how to manage. First step, mother is RH negative, husband blood group to be done. If the partner's blood group is negative, we are happy that this baby is going to be negative in all possible cases, nothing is to be done. If however, the husband's blood group is positive, we need to do the ICT at booking and at 28 weeks. Now, if the ICT remains negative, we give the antenatal prophylactic antity and repeat the anti-D at the time of delivery. Or if you have any other procedure like intrauterine procedures, like we do an amniocentesis, a CVS, or if there was a trauma or APH. So this is as simple and as clear as possible. If, however, at any point in time, this ICT becomes positive, we will manage it as an ICT, RH, isoimmunized pregnancy, and we will deal with it later. So here important fact is that the ICT needs to be done at booking and at 28 weeks and give prophylactic anti-D at 28 weeks and at delivery. At the time of delivery, we need to do your uh, DCT for the baby and the blood group. If the blood group of the baby is positive, then only give anti-D. If the blood group is negative, you don't give anti-D. There is a little bit of a, uh, you know, coming in about the paternal, uh, paternal heterozygosity and cell-free DNA. So I will touch upon it if there is interest among the audience. And for now, I will go ahead with this. So that's how it is, so RH positive, negative, and then we manage it as RH isoimmunized. Just a few points about the labor management. Continuous electronic fetal monitoring, no stripping of membranes, no fundal pressure, no uterine massage, delayed cord clamping. So earlier they used to say early cord clamping, but there has been a lot of studies to say that there's no point in early cord clamping. We can do a normal delayed cord clamping. Avoid manual removal of placenta. So avoid any procedure which can 
um, uh, enhance the fetal maternal hemorrhage and we should avoid that. Placenta to be delivered spontaneously using control cord traction. Cord should be kept as long as possible. AMTSL should be done with oxytocin and not methogen. For PPH, again, avoid methogen. Protect the vaginal and the perineal wounds with laceration or exposure to the fetal blood. Cord blood, do a DCT, uh, bilirubin, hematocrit, hemoglobin, and reticulocyte count. A little bit about anti-D administration. So it has to be given at 28 weeks and within 72 hours of delivery, or if you've done any procedures like CVS and amniocentesis. ECV, molar pregnancy, first trimester miscarriage, pregnancy termination, ectopic pregnancy, antenatal hemorrhage, hemorrhage uh, IUD in the second and third trimester. Bottom line is, any reason to give anti-D, we should give anti-D. There is no reason why we should not give anti-D. Some uh, rec the guidelines also recommend an anti-D at 28 weeks and at 34 weeks. Well, uh, we do not do this. We give anti-D anti only at 28 weeks. Now, suppose if you gave anti-D at 28 weeks and the patient came in labor at 30 weeks. So, we generally believe that if you've had a delivery within three weeks of the anti-D, you can skip the postnatal dose unless there is excessive fetal maternal hemorrhage. Sometimes there is repeated hemorrhage in the second and third trimester. Then there is a role of doing three weekly ICT titers. If the ICT is positive, that means your anti-D that you have given is still working. And then you don't need to repeat an anti-D. If your ITT has become negative after a dose of uh, anti-D and there is another bout of bleeding, then you will give another dose of anti-D. So once you are given anti-D, you know that ICT can be low positive, a titer of one is to four. So if your ICT has become negative after giving anti-D and you had another bout of bleeding, then you can repeat one dose of anti-D. So that's how we manage repeated. Now the next part and little confusing part is once your ICT becomes positive, once your ICT becomes positive, your next question is, has the critical titer been reached? So the critical titer is 1 is to 8 or 1 is to 16. We take it as 1 is to 16. Now if the 1 is to 16 is reached, first step is do not do ICT. Because whether it is 1 is to 16 or whether it is 1 in 256 or 1 in, 1 in 20 to 2400, it does not matter. Your management will not change. And you are giving IV, IG, dexamethasone, nothing is going to change. All you need to do is MCA PSV. If that MCA PSV is more than 1.5 MOM, then if it is less than 1.5, you can keep on repeating your MCA PSV. If at any point in time it is more than 1.5 MOM, check your gestational age. If it is less than 35 weeks, you can give IUT. If it is more than 35 weeks, you deliver. At AIMS, currently we will give IUT even at 34 weeks and six days. That's our upper limit. Today also we gave at 34 weeks and four days. So we will give till 34 weeks and six days. Beyond 35 weeks, we won't give IUT, we deliver. So if the critical titer is not reached, that is the titer is say one in four or one in six or one in eight, then we will repeat the titer four weekly till 24 weeks and then two weekly till term. And if the titer remains below critical titer, we don't do MCA PSV. We will only do crit titer, ICT titer. So that is how it is mo monitored. So MCA PSV has been the revolutionary thing since 2000 uh, when this was first described. And 2005 onwards, amniocentesis for the bilirubin has not been done at AIMS. It is easy to do, easy to insonate, easy to replicate with a good sensitivity. So we can simply go to the base of the skull, put on the Doppler, do the MCA PSV. And then we take the peak systolic velocity and we measure it. And it's so simple that if, if, if at any gestation, the value of MCA PSV is two times the normal, you think that it is something which is wrong. So like say, for example, at 24 weeks, the value is more than 28. Then you feel that uh, 48 then you feel that, okay, it may be raised. And then you start checking the nomograms. Now, there was this study, which is called the Pettit study, in which they said that if there is a previous baby who had a, a IUT at very early gestation, can we delay the IUT? 
So they said that if you start giving IVIG right from say 12 to 13 weeks onwards and you give IVIG weekly, then there's a possibility that you can delay the IUT by around two to three weeks. Now, uh, we started giving IVIG very, very vigorously and very, very enthusiastically. The cost of this IVIG is exponential. We admit the patient and we give them IVIG. You know, the government is paying. But we saw that maybe the effect is not very high for us. So we, guessed, we gave for around 15, 16 mothers and we thought that probably it's not very, very effective. And anyway, we can start doing IV, uh, IUTs by 18 weeks of gestation. So it is just, um, you know, five to six weeks that the gain that we, ever, we were looking at by and the maximum dose of weekly that we are looking at is six to seven weeks. So we were not very convinced practically, but there is this study which says that if you want to postpone, then probably then you can give IVIG. So the blood which is used is O negative. Leuco reduced, irradiated with a hematocrit of 75 to 85%. And uh, there is a, a SAGM reduction under a closed unit and it is cross-matched with the mother. The volume which is given depends on what is the weight of the baby. So depending on the gestational age, the fetal weight, it is taken and fetal weight is multiplied by 0.14 to look at the fetal volume. There are various methods to calculate the volume. In fact, the easiest way is that there is a table which is given. And if you want to increase the hematocrit from by say 30%, you have to multiply the weight by 0 0.06. So say for example, if a thousand weight baby, one kg baby, you generally give around 60 ml. So that's how you calculate the volume. And the other one is based on a gestational age. So say for example, you want to uh, transfuse in a 28 kg baby the, and increase by 30%, you have to give around 60 ml. So that's how you calculate. The target hematocrit is around 50%. So I want to make the hematocrit by around 50% and that's the target hematocrit that we will take. So we generally do it under uh, no, no local anesthesia is given, no sedation is given, we don't give antibiotics. Corticosteroids are given. If I'm doing the procedure after 26 to 27 weeks, I will cover, give a cover of corticosteroids because fetal distress can happen. But we paralyze the baby. So now we use vecuronium and we give it intramuscular. Sometimes if the placenta is anterior, we can give it intravenous also to the baby. So currently we are using vecuronium because it is now easily available. So no local, no sedation, no antibiotics, only corticosteroids to be given. Where to puncture? We prefer doing the puncture in the umbilical cord insertion. That's your general preference. And we can, we also like to do the free loop. So world over people don't want to do the free loop, but I think it's the habit of, or the training. And there is also the intrahepatic portion inside the liver. For us, uh, outside people do more liver. We are not doing so much liver. Increasingly we are in, uh, doing liver. So a small video of the procedure. So, these are the vecuronium or the paralytic agent. So this is the vecuronium which is used for fetal paralysis. This is the blood that is irradiated. And these are preloaded syringes that we use. And we keep the preloaded syringes. And generally, as I decided, the volume is depending on the weight and the gestational. So this is the mother who's prepared. It is like an OPD procedure. We admit the patient one, the same day and we can discharge. So this is a fetal thigh. And this is a needle which is coming into the fetal thigh. And we will put the injection intramuscularly into the fetal thigh under continuous ultrasound guidance. And after we have given the intramuscular injection, we will wait for the baby to uh, not move. And this is your anterior placenta and this is your cord insertion. So this is one of the, like, you know, the easy ones where you can directly go into the cord insertion and you can see the blood going through the various loop. Now, this is a baby which is was paralyzed and yet kept on moving. So sometimes it happens and you just have to hope that the baby will stop moving and keep your needle steady. So this is the point here where the needle is. Now, posterior placentas are a little tricky. But this was a rather maybe simpler of the posterior placentas where you have to go inside 
and then you will take a sample of blood for a pre-transfusion hematopoiesis. Now this is again 18 weeks hydropic baby trying to you know get into the cord. So these are very thin cords at 18 weeks. And look at the placenta; it is like hugely big. So this is a hydropic baby at 18 weeks. So that becomes a little difficult. Now this is the liver, okay? And we are going here into the intrahepatic part. So this is uh, a rather fixed part, and people like to do it. So we have also started doing now the intrahepatic part. So this is kind of splinted between the lobes of the liver. So here you can see the intrahepatic parts. And this is the later on in gestation when the intrahepatic part, you can see it more clearly. But what really happens is the moment you try to go through the baby, the baby starts breathing, moving, every possible movement. So although it looks simple, the moment you put the needle inside the baby, the baby will start you know, doing all kinds of activity. So that is a bit tricky. So these are the various places where you can do it. Once you're inside it, you will take a bit of a sample and then you start pushing the blood. Once you have put, pushed the adequate amount of blood, at the end of it, you will withdraw the blood to know how much is the end hematocrit. Now, <clears throat> after transfusion, we follow up with MCA-PFC after one transfusion. And then the rate of fall of hematocrit is taken as 1% per day. And we will follow give the subsequent transfusion is less than 30%. To be safe, we follow the patient in totality, look at the post-transfusion, whether hydropic or not. And hydrops takes a few weeks to settle. Generally, the hematocrit picks up, but the hydrops will take some time to settle. The last transfusion is done between 34 to 35 weeks. Extreme precautions are taken. The OT is ready. The steroid cover is there. The nursery is ready. There is an OT backup. So I think that's one of the most tricky things to cover. And the last transfusions are the most technically cha challenging and we, we usually do one prick. If it is not happening, we abandon the procedure. The blood can go waste, but we don't do another prick unless I can see the cord because IUDs can happen with multiple pricks. So I think that is all about the procedure. I would just like to say that over the years, we have been doing almost 100 procedures in a year and the referrals have only increased. But the good part is that the referrals with high drops has decreased. So that means that these things are being picked up early. The POG at which we are doing transfusions have gradually increased, but we still do transfusions around 18 to begin transfusions around 18 weeks. And in one babies, we are usually doing usually two to three transfusions. Maximally, we have done around seven to eight transfusions in one baby. The POG at delivery has gradually shifted from 32 to 33 to 37 to 38 weeks. We do the last transfusion around 34, 35 weeks and deliver them around 35, 36 weeks. If we look at our survivals are around 96%, which is quite all right, given the world literature also. Even in hydropic babies, our survivals are around 96 to 97%. Complications are preterm labor, transient bradycardia, displaced needle, rupture of membranes, and bradycardia requiring cesarean section. In fact, that's the most difficult thing that we anticipate that immediately after procedure, there is a bradycardia and you have to rush the patient to a cesarean section. Pregnancy loss has been gradually coming down and now it is reported, we report it around 2.6% per pregnancy loss rate. So this was our latest publication that we have looked into it and reported a 90.9% 90, 90 survival, which is quite okay. And our ex now we are now experiencing more of more minor antigens with our blood bank testing more. So I think that is all I would uh, uh, like to talk about. But just before I end, I would just uh, mention one case of a golden uh, blood group where this patient had a one in a million blood group. This patient had previous eight uh, losses in which she had eclampsia and IUD every patient. In her sixth pregnancy, she was referred to AIMS where she was told that she does not have a compatible blood group. Please do not get pregnant till we find a blood group. But she again got pregnant and she aborted and again got pregnant and she came to us at 19 weeks. And since that time, she was remained admitted in AIMS till she delivered. At admission, her MCA PSV was raised, and but the blood bank told us we don't have blood. What will I do? Now we gave her IVIG immediately, and we tried to you know pass some time to see what is can we do about it. 
She required urgent transfusion, but the dilemma was that there was no blood. By 21 weeks, she developed high drops. Then the blood bank told us something which is very, very surprising that she has something which was called as RH17, which was one in a million blood group. So there was absent. So this was a blood group, which was D negative, negative phenotype. That means she did not have D double negative phenotype. And if you look at the, there was no Indian data, but it was like one in one lakh in Japan. And that was the most frequent phenotype found in Japan. So they sent her blood to the Bristol to, to look at that blood typing. And they found out that it they confirmed the phenotype and identified as anti-RH17. In India, there was only one person of that blood group who refused to donate. Japan had 32. They were willing to send it. But how to get the blood from Japan? What was the cost, the prerequisites of documentation? And we were told that we had to to book two tickets, one for the transporter and one for blood because blood is supposed to be a live organ. Now we had to get that money. So we, we had to arrange from, we tried from JSSK, but there was no time because the baby was already, and it was COVID times. And the, it, the baby was already hydropic. So there was, we talked to our MSSO, AIMS, and also Rashtri Arogyanidhi, which is a government scheme. So there was this NGO, Relaxo who paid for us and the blood was brought in from Japan within 48 hours. And we did six transfusions and we got three such installments from Japan from various sources. And we did three, six transfusion for, uh, for this particular mother. And we managed to take this pregnancy till 31 weeks when she started having fetal decelerations and there was no blood for the mother. So what we did is autologous transfusion where we took the blood out from the mother and we did the cesarean section so that if required, we would transfuse the mother her own blood at the end of surgery. But thankfully we did not require it. Now at the end of all of it, the mother and the baby are doing fine. And it was actually the first successful case of RH negative and eight successful case in the whole world. So. Thank you very much. And I would conclude by saying that there are five pointers to the right management of RH negative. Was blood group done for this mother? If her blood group was negative, husband blood group done. If the husband blood group was positive, was ICT done? If the ICT was negative, was anti-D given? If the ICT is positive now, has the patient been referred to the fetal medicine center on time? So thank you very much for your patient here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aparna. Yes, Dr. Kishore. Uh, excellent deliberations. And uh, as always, uh, she's so eloquent and uh, very clear <laughs> in what she wants to say. Yes, sir. And, uh, and so many things uh, she has, uh, such a big topic, she has made it a very small topic. I, actually, um, I just want to say that uh, uh, this all is this topic is also very close to me because I consider myself as a perinatologist because I was a pediatrician before I became a gynecologist. So and I used to get so many patients uh, of RH incompatibility and we used to do so many exchange transfusions. So the incidence has become so less that we hardly do a exchange transfusions for uh, these uh, babies because most of them. Uh, have now received the uh, this anti D and also now the surveillance is there and uh, IUTs and all being given. Now the more important uh, it's uh, non immune hydrops is very very common as compared to this and ABO is also much common. I just uh, want to uh, say that one thing that the, the critical value that she has said that one in sixteen it varies from uh, various uh, labs but one in sixteen we can take and the the importance is that. Once the critical value is reached, you have a very high chance of the baby dying within a week. So therefore, one has to act. And be below that, you have to do surveillance and you can continue to do your uh, blood testing. But one, one in 63, you have to go for MCV, PSV, and uh, that is very, very helpful in uh, managing these patients. And I just want to ask her one question, whether uh, she... Uh, 
uh, I mean, there is there was a talk of heterozygous uh, whether we should uh, uh, check the uh, zygosity heterozygous of the. In my opinion, I don't think it is. Uh, it should be done because even if it is a uh, heterozygous, there is always a fifty percent chance of the uh, D and D positive one. So what is the use of getting it then? I think Currently, more important is knowing the blood group of the of the baby. अगर वो हमें अर्ली पता चल जाए that may be in some countries it is done so um, sir, thank you very much for dr aparna uh, if you can answer my question uh, yes sir sir actually heterozygosity is like you said it is a two step procedure yes so in patients who are iso immunized we do the heterozygosity of the father if it is homozygous then the baby is anyways going to be positive and you have to do the mcaps monitoring <clears throat> but if the babe the parent is heterozygous then there is a 50% chance that, that the baby might be negative uh, yes. then in that case you do the cell free dna to know the baby's blood oh, group oh then you have to do additionally cell free dna yes. that yes. is the so point. then you do the cell free dna and if the baby is negative then you don't have to monitor that is the advantage hey, ben, why don't we do cell free dna straight away okay so sir so basically <laughs> because the heterozygosity is 2500 and the cell free dna is 20000 that is the basically yes that the, the cost basically yes. the cost is and, and just one more question if the patient is uh, uh, very high uh, one in one in uh, let us say 256 that that mother how how uh, how can she become pregnant then i mean is do you do exchange transfusion for the mother no, the mother sir, no, sir, no, sir, nothing 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 at all okay, okay. so doctor asked would you like to say something congratulations yeah. dr parnaya yeah. Yeah, Dr. Arti, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Very informative talk and crisp, and every point was very clear. Especially the procedure of IUT was uh, shown elaborately, and it just depicts that it's not a very complicated procedure, and it's a very good uh, deliberation for all doing the revision. That once the critical titers are reached, MCV PSV has to be done uh, to assess the timing of delivery. thank you and dr anupam if you are there would you like to comment can i ask one question dr uh, parna that even in the first transfusion you need an irradiated blood because there would be no graft versus host reaction that yes. is what is the aim to prevent a graft versus host reaction you always give so it even the first one yes. has to be irradiated yes okay as i also want to say aparna yeah yeah you are, yeah. All, yeah, you are always wonderful and thank you Sa dr sadna for inviting all of us to listen to this huge successful uh, webinar and you know this rh negative i would just everything has been told by aparna Oh, my love. She is the uh, person who can uh, make everything crystal clear. And uh, one thing we all must remember: not a very big, big thing. Simple quality antenatal care awareness regarding immunization and all those five pointers should be written in your OPD. Timely referral to a fetal medicine. god is uh, much needed because i have seen so many obstetrician and gynecologists doing um now this is going on this is this is this is what to do now how much to do the ict and all they are so much of confused but i think timely consulting uh, this uh, nowadays it's a time to refer the patient and uh, no spill birth at any cost so uh, and uh, like uh, so many people are confused at if we are doing mtp medical termination at 7 weeks of pregnancy then should we give it or not if it is a molar uh, uh, partial molar how mu how much to give and what to give and all these things i think that very simply she has uh, clear uh, everything in her uh, this, um, uh, this speech that uh, whenever you get the thumb rule is uh, if you are confused and uh, don't uh, think just give uh, antd and ict positive if it is matlab uh, uh, one should remember if it is ict positive please do not give any antd thank you thank you aparna yeah. brilliant presentation there, there is, is a hand raised uh, one uh, doctor one, is raised yeah one question also for aparna if it has been antd has been given for subchorionic bleeding first trimester do we have to repeat the ict titer so aparna your comment of not not <laughs> ma'am we should repeat ict at 28 yes. weeks 
after NTD, uh, it is a, always a very low titer positivity if, if it is there. So we have to repeat. And the patient with recurrent bleeding have more chances of isoimmunization as well. So yes. this is a very relevant question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you please? Uh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Good evening, uh, Dr. Pramila. Yeah, Dr. Pramila, welcome. Uh, Aparna, heartiest congratulations for the excellent presentation as always. I just wanted to ask any guidelines for the use of carbitocin for AMTL uh, in RH negative, whether we can use carbitocin or not? No, ma'am. I'm not aware because the carbitocin has been suggested for AMTSL and um, it is supposed to be physiological, ma'am. So I don't think we should not not use it because it does not cause uh, like, you know, non-physiological non like methergen, but it is not specifically mentioned. Okay. Because, because I have read the literature on carbitocin. Unlike oxytocin, it has a half-life of 45 minutes and it causes continuous retraction of the uterus. It's so, a longer acting oxytocin, but it is still an oxytocin. Yes. And I also, because whatever literature has been there on carbitocin, they have described it, but they have not really mentioned on RH. So, but I don't seem, it doesn't seem like, you know, it is non-physiological. So, okay. Secondly, when you're doing a IUT, uh, do you wait for the hematocrit of the fetus before calculating the... We this don't thing. have to wait, ma'am. Now we have hemo cues. They, they they tell us in not less less in less than fifteen seconds. Okay, so you uh, uh, take out the hematocrit and then yes. calculate how much blood volume has to be transfused. Yes, immediately. Okay, thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Doctor Parna. Now I'll uh, invite Doctor Ayushi to take over to the second session. Ayushi, are you there? Uh, Vanda, you go ahead. Okay, okay. I'll start my sharing my screen again. So we are opening for the second session now. And uh, another second session is a, a panel discussion, a case-based discussion on Irish negative mother. It is being moderated by Dr. Mala Srivastava, who is HOD uh, and senior consultant and professor Gripmer and at Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. She has been vice president for ISOPAP and a past president AOGD qualifications everyone knows and she has been decorated with so many awards and accolades and she has been trained in robotic surgery in France. Welcome Dr. Mala and another uh, expert is Dr. Tina Verma. She's uh, uh, a person who has been handling high-risk pregnancies and she's a senior, senior consultant at Cloud9 Hospital and uh, in Hyderabad. Uh, I'm an excellent uh, person and an excellent clinician. Welcome, Dr. Tina. The, and the experts for the session would be none other than Dr. Shada Jain, our mentor and guide, a friend philosopher, and a person who can be looked upon to whenever you are in need. And everything has been her brainchild, and she still holds our hand and carries her forward. She's founder, secretary general of Delhi Gynecologist Forum. Uh, welcome, ma'am. And another expert is Dr. Sadhna Gupta, none other than uh, the vice, uh, the president of NIGF, decorated with so many uh, awards. And another expert is Dr. Shashi Bala Bhosle Sao. Uh, she is uh, a president of Gaulier OBGYN Society, and she's consultant at Public Health Department and Fam Family Welfare MP Government. Welcome, ma'am. The panelists for the session would be Dr. Pooja Sinha, who has a special interest in uh, infertility and fetal medicine, and uh, she's uh, uh, working in Rohatak. Uh, Dr. Kusum Varma, uh, she is director Ashish Nursing Home, and she has uh, again been awarded so many uh, awards and honors, and special interest is in emergency ops care and high risk pregnancy. Next is Dr. Anu Chaparia. She is a, a secretary Gorakhpur Ops and Gynae Society. And uh, she has been a treasurer also, a scientific secretary, and a member of the uh, and uh, Gorakhpur mm -hmm. Men Menopause and Isopop Society. Welcome, Dr. Anu. Next is Dr. Divya Singhal. She is uh, uh, in Fortis Hospital, Cloud9 uh, Hospital, and lap uh, RG Stone Laparoscopy Hospital. She's president DGF North Delhi with special interest in high-risk pregnancy, breast, and CA cervix prevention. Welcome, Dr. Divya. Then Dr. Pramila Malik, Senior Consultant OBGYN, Past President, 
Gurgaon OBS and Gaini Society, special fields of interest are infertility and high risk pregnancy. Welcome, ma'am. So, Dr. Sukirti, she is a secretary, Ludhiana OBS and Gaini Society. We did not have her CV. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sukirti, are you there? Would you like to say a few words for yourself? Next is Dr. Anshu Kakkar, uh, who is a, a consultant at Kakkar Eye and Maternity Center, Dehradun. And uh, she has been secretary of Delhi, uh, Dehradun Ops and Gaini Society and has been on the editorial team. Welcome, Dr. Anshu. And next is Dr. Monica Gupta, who is from the city of Albar. She is... Mm -hmm. HOD and Senior Consultant, Dutch Hospital, Alvar, and Special Interest in High-Risk Pregnancy and Pregnancy with Medical Complication. So welcome. I hand over to the moderators, Dr. Mala and Dr. Tina. Your Thanks. moderators for today, Dr. Vandana and Dr. Ayushi. So I'll stop share now. Thanks, Dr. Vandana, for that excellent presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. Dr. Myself and Dr. Tina Verma is very happy to have this panel discussion today with all the esteemed panelists. And I'm sure, Dr. Tina, are you there with me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, yeah. Sharda Jain, ma'am, and Vanna Gupta, ma'am, for inviting me here and moderating the session with Dr. Mala, ma'am, for Arish Negative Pregnancy. So after that uh, nice, excellent lecture by Dr. Aparna, we are going to have cases of RH uh, negative patients. So what is the aim of this panel? We want to define what is RH alumnization, burden the disease, prevalence, and perinatal outcome, prevention. How can we prevent RH alumnization? Precautions to be taken during first pregnancy, to prevent alloimmunization during antenatal, interpartum, as well as postnatal considerations, approach to a case of RH alloimmunization, monitoring, as well as management. How do we interpret MCA, PSV, MOMS, knowing the abnormalities and how to proceed, introduction to IUT and follow-up after IUT and care of the newborn. So we all know, according to the recent systematic study, there is, a, there is an evidence that 3.7 lakh cases of RH hemolytic disorder worldwide each year. India is responsible for about 56,672 of these. Furthermore, our hospital-based study reported an overall incidence of RH alloimmunization to be nearly 1.3% in North Indian women during the antenatal period. The RH alloimmunization rate was 10% and 0.12% in RH negative and RH positive mothers respectively. The incidence of post-pregnancy RH alumnization has decreased from 1% to 2% after postpartum anti-D immunoprophylaxis. Evidence shows that the incidence of RH alumnization during pregnancy further reduced from 1.8% to 0.14% with RH immunoprophylaxis 300 microgram of anti-D immunoglobulin given at 28 weeks. Despite all this prophylaxis, despite the knowledge being there, the burden of disease is still worrisome. So we have to be aware, we have to adhere to the guidelines and that is the key of success. So I hand over to Dr. Tina to carry on the first case of the evening. Good evening. So this question is for Dr. Pooja. So there's a lady who comes, Mrs. A, she's 23 years old. First, uh, just uh, one year married and urine pregnancy test positive. Now, her periods have been irregular and she comes to you in your uh, antenatal um, clinic. At that time, you tell her to get all her routine antenatal investigations and uh, next, and you also ask for a scan. Now, the scan tells that the CRL is of around 16.2 mm, corresponding to eight weeks, two days. Cardiac activity is present, so obviously a viable pregnancy, but her blood group is A negative. Now, how are you going to proceed, Dr. Pooja? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, first step would be to confirm uh, or find out the husband's blood group and whether he's, uh, the uh, husband is RH negative or RH positive. If the husband is RH negative, 
uh, we do need to do a baseline uh, ICT. Whether the husband is RH negative or RH positive. Okay. And, uh, and also for the fetus, we would like to uh, furthermore go for the routine scan at 11 to 14 weeks for the NTNB scan. Yes. So indirect, the main learning point is that indirect tombs test is to be done even if the husband group is negative. And if you have heard Dr. Aparna's lecture, she has also said that even if the RH, the blood group of the patient is positive, even then we need to do go ahead with ICT sometimes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So what is the indirect Coombs test and what is its significance, Dr. Kusum? Dr. Kusum, are you there? Would anybody like to take this question? Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, thank you for adding me in this webinar. Uh, first, recipient serum is obtained containing antigen. Then the donor blood sample is uh, added to the serum. The recipient IgG that targeted the donor's red blood cells form antibody antigen reaction. And then antigen, anti-human IgG are added to the solution and the agglutination occurs. That is, uh, human IgG are attached to the red blood cells. This is the indirect agglutination test. Yes, so basically indirect agglutination test detects the whether the uh, mother has IgG antibodies in her. And the, if the RBC is coated with that antibody, IgG antibody, the Coombs reagent, if added, will agglutinate and then form this indirect agglutination test. So, uh, Dr. Mala, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. So, next, Dr. Aruna, how will you proceed if husband's blood group is positive and ICT is negative? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mala. Uh, as the husband is positive, uh, they are uh, Irish incordant couple. And her ICT is negative. The uh, management uh, is in two parts. First, counseling of the patient. And second, prevention of ICU immunization. For counseling, she should be made aware that she is RH negative. And there is least chances of first pregnancies uh, to be affected. But there may be risk in subsequent pregnancy. And she should be educated about all the sensitizing event that occur during pregnancy. And she should report to her doctor immediately if any such event has occurred. And delivery should occur at a place where all the facilities are available. Now comes the role of prevention uh, of ISO immunization. So ICT is negative. So we will uh, repeat the ICT again at 28 weeks of gestation. And if ICT is negative, then we will give anti-D prophylaxis of 300 microgram, preferably at the deltoid. Now here there is second school of third. They uh, recommend that ICT should be done at 26 weeks of pregnancy. And if it is negative, then 150 microgram of anti-D prophylaxis should be given. And again, ICT should be repeated at 32 weeks. And if it is again negative, then second dose of anti-D should be given as prophylaxis. This pregnancy is now followed up to term and post-delivery. Baby uh, blood group should be done. If the baby is RH positive, then anti-D prophylaxis with 300 micrograms should be given to her. Very well said, Dr. Aruna. And there was a, some discussion regarding husband to detect whether the husband is homozygous or heterozygous. And that yes, we can yes. come, this discussion we can come later on and yes, the importance yes. we can do it later on as well. So Dr. Sukriti, how does parent, paternal RH diagnosis place its importance in RH negative discordant couple? Dr. Sukriti, are you there? He's not there, Dr. Mala. Anyone can take it, I think. See, basically, as Dr. Aparna already told you, that if the husband is RH negative, then there is no, no further problems for us. But if the husband is positive, 
then there are facilities in our in some other hospitals especially in gangaram hospital we are doing sometimes counseling the patient regarding the zygosity of the husband if the husband is homozygous we know all the children 100% children will be positive but if the father is heterozygous then in that case of course 50% children will be negative and 50% will be positive and there is a role of cell free dna uh, cell free dna testing and knowing the fetus blood group and that facility is also done in our hospital so in some special cases when we did think that a counseling is important and it's important to know the homozygosity or heterozygosity of the partner or the husband then in that case we can go ahead with doing these tests as and when required that is the clinical significance of it and we all know like in cochrane database about 10% of all pregnancy involved rh negative mother with an rh positive fetus and in the first pregnancy 60% of rh negative women will have a rh positive baby clearly if the father is known to be rh negative the baby will also be rh negative and then antd will not be needed but in case there is heterozygous father 40% of women carrying rh negative babies will get antd unnecessary that is the importance of having this zygosity check, checked for the father so dr anshu are you there now we go to the second case mrs b 23 years old primary gravida married for 2 years rh discordant couple she was referred at 10 weeks in view of fetus having risk of anemia she was counseled by her primary gynec obstetrician that since it's a discordant couple there is a chance of fetal anemia so she her routine antenatal investigations were reviewed and she had a complaint of spotting pervagin ultrasound dating scan crl 35.2 10 plus 2 weeks cardiac activity present however with a huge subchorionic hemorrhage measuring 44 into 22 now patient wants to know how is the baby as risk of anemia first pregnancy how to counsel her how to educate her in regards of a blood group so uh, we are talking of a mother who has been noted to have a subchorionic bleed so this causes uh, 730 uh so this causes the uh, fetus a risk of ic immunization since so this rh negative women carrying rh positive baby the risk of rh aluminization during or immediately after first pregnancy is 1% but if the first pregnancy is negative no anemia but the risk of rh sensitization should be always there and this the, these events this uh, subchorionic hemorrhage is a sensitizing event and this should be managed immediately by giving anti d within 72 hours that is the important point that to note because okay. these are sensitizing events these small one event thing, one thing very clear may make the dose clear because 150 is not available in india yes the dose they say what first trimester is 150 but since 150 is not available we oh almost all of us are giving 300 microgram only that is the I, only problem but otherwise i think i think mala if the uh, mala if panel is not available and like two or three panel are absent then you uh, like you can invite any expert for the comment okay. so that uh, let's ha huh, so that dr sharda and dr shashi wala is with us okay okay so i will be on the end but uh, invite madam and dr shashi wala okay. first like the panel is there yes So, Dr. Monica, how does sensitization occur? Ma'am, when the baby is Rh positive in the Rh negative mother, the few of the blood cells from the fetus comes into the maternal circulation and they trigger the immunization process. And initially, the only IgM antibodies are formed, which is not passed through the placenta. So, nothing, no harm is there. But if it is a second time sensitization, IgG antibodies are formed. and they pass through the placenta causing the destruction of the baby's cell baby's rbcs leading to first leading to anemia then to the jaundice and then the hydrox and other complications and they usually occur in second or third trimester though it occur in the first trimester also but the incidence is less but it is more when there is some subchorionic hemorrhage is there or we do some of the procedures like cvs amniocentesis or something like that or in the during Uh, later on we if we do a external cephalic version 
or we or during it is more chances during the delivery of the baby if the baby is delivered by it is it is not delivered by the gentle method we are push, pulling and pushing the things we are just spilling the fetal blood into the maternal circulation or into the episiotomy area we are not managing the third stage of labor appropriately we should be very gentle we should not give methadone only oxytocin should be used and we should keep the cord a long for the uh, for the management of the baby or it can be if the mother has got some uh, wrong blood transfusion she was sensitized before it can affect in this pregnancy also or in the cases of abdominal trauma blunt injuries there can be an allo immunization uh, sensitization can be there and it is less in the cases of abo incompatibility because the uh, rbcs are engulfed by these macrophages and they don't sensitize the mother so in the cases of abo incompatibility chances of iso immunization is less and if it is abo incompatible parents the chances are more yes so the learning points here yaar uh, here are that even in the first pregnancy although there is no risk of anemia but the lady should be educated about the potentially sensitizing events because if you don't counsel her if you don't tell her that what are the potentially sensitizing events like spotting subcutaneous hemorrhage or any bleeding any blunt trauma anything like that then she will never report to you within 72 hours she will not remember this that she has to receive an antidote the first and foremost thing is educate the patient herself and then whenever the patient comes to your clinic in emergency obviously she has to receive antidote in adequate dose maintained cold chain and given in a right manner in i am uh, in deltoid so that is one of the learning points here and then we are moving ahead with the next question can i comment something uh, yeah. this uh, rh sensitization the second when the exposure is second time it's not only the production of igg antibodies igg antibodies but it's an amnestic response and that is there is a rapid production when the immune system is exposed to the antigen for the second time there is a rapid production of the antibodies that is why every pregnancy presents earlier with hemolytic disease of the newborn yes and uh, if the we are giving a dose of 300 but if the fetal maternal hemorrhage is supposed to be more than 30 ml of blood fetal blood then the dose should be calculated by doing the rosit test or the clean kb test and then given the adequate dose otherwise in spite of giving the 300 microgram the patient will get sensitized if the adequate dose is not given especially in cases of abruptio there is a massive fetal maternal hemorrhage then we need to do a, a fetal amount calculate the volume of the fetal maternal hemorrhage and then give adequate dose of nt so dr aruna uh, is dr aruna here yeah 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 so obviously there there is a potentially sensitizing event at 10 weeks 2 days now she comes to your uh, clinic and you get your get her ict done the ict is negative so now what are you going to do how are you going to manage her or how are you going to prevent the sensitization once we know this that this is the first pregnancy and she is going to be sensitized so how, what what will be your approach in that as uh, she has suffered the uh, sensitizing event so to prevent the iso immunization prophylactic dose of anti d should be given and in the first trimester the fetal maternal hemorrhage is generally 1 to 5 ml and for that uh, 50 to 100 microgram is sufficient but in india we don't uh, have this dose so we generally give 300 microgram uh, to her a higher dose is uh, doesn't have any bad effect and uh, the anti d uh, year uh, has the uh, prevention preventive effect and anti d uh, first Hello. does the anti d first does the immunosuppression of the mother so that more antibodies are not formed and there is rapid clearance of the rh positive cells from the maternal blood so can you prevent the sensitization dr aruna yeah sensitization can be prevent if a uh, cons proper counseling of the couple has been done and uh, the dose of rh antibody is given appropriate at appropriate time with maintenance of cold chain for the counseling the patient should be first be aware that they are rh negative and preferably if premarital counseling can be done it should be done 
and if uh, before a uh, pregnancy rh uh, blood type of every female should be done and anti d prophylaxis should be done at proper dose due antenatal prophylaxis postnatal prophylaxis prophylaxis and if any sensitizing event has occurred yes rightly said dr aruna even a threatened pregnancy loss or yeah. a subchorionic hematoma these are the indications for anti d immunoprophylaxis because these are the sensitizing events especially when we see nowadays some people they are going for medical termination of pregnancy by taking the drugs over the counter these are also the sensitizing agents because the patients are not aware that they are not doing their blood group and they are not going to a physician also they are taking mtp pills over the counter so education has to be there that at least before going for medical termination though it is not a protocol but they should know their what is their blood group and if it is a negative they should have the recommendation of giving anti d even if they are going for surgical termination medical termination even in ectopic pregnancy molar pregnancy chorion villus sampling all these events are can be sensitizing events and before 20 weeks all these events like amniocentesis other invasive fetal procedures these patients need to be covered with anti d within 72 hours ideally and we have to educate our women that these are the potentially sensitizing events and these should be taken care of they should report to the physician they should to report to the obstetrician and get a adequate dose of anti d so normally during sensitization in the first trimester less than 4 ml fetal metal hemorrhage is expected so we can give ideally we can give more 150 anti d but definitely since it is not available we all are giving 300 microgram what after 20 weeks there are incidences like abruption placenta blood blunt trauma i intrauterine fetal demise external cephalic version placenta pleura with bleeding and invasive procedures then in that case definitely the dose is 300 microgram but we have to also think that if there is a massive abruption placenta sometimes we have to quantify fetal maternal hemorrhage by cleobedke test and then give the dose of anti d so dr pooja is it necessary to repeat antibody screening patients at 28 weeks of gestation before administration of anti d immune globulin what are your insights about routine administration of anti d prophylaxis this meeting is being recorded okay ma'am uh, see uh, for a patient who's uh, previously icd yeah, negative yeah. uh who's previously icd negative uh she may have had some episode which she has not noticed, has not noticed. so uh, then we do, do need to repeat icd before giving anti d and the dose will be 300 micrograms and uh, in the routine prophylaxis we recommend uh, anti d to be given at 28 weeks and to be repeated uh of uh, at delivery if there is excessive bleeding we can invite a uh, comment from our expert dr sharda ma'am if the baby is positive okay will i you want to say something uh, if yeah. the baby is rh yeah. positive we have to repeat the ntd and if the there is excessive bleeding we have to calculate the dose and may have to give more dose but if baby is rh positive we have to give yes if baby is rh negative yes. yes. so let us let, let us yes. be very clear in the take home message first thing is this that at 28 weeks the icd has to be done and once the icd is negative only then the antd has to be given if the icd is positive we are going to monitor it as icd positive pregnancy if obviously when this once we have given anti d we are not going to repeat icd during the antenatal course and later on once the baby is delivered we check the blood group of the baby if it is positive the patient will require anti d if it is negative the patient will not require anti d so that is the clear message thank you want to say dr shashi 
uh, yeah, uh, even if uh, the patient is neg uh, C positive at ICT at 28 weeks, is we do give, right? Uh, if if a RH negative patient comes to us because of the silent, we don't want to take any chances. So we give one anti D at twenty after doing in, uh, indirect wound test. That is what we are doing. So indirect wound test, if you don't do, then if you have to give, so see they don't give thing. they don't give any history normally. Nowadays, it has routine. They have taken some the other medical terminations or medical bills or something. So if the patient is RH negative, husband is RH positive, and the baby is precious, and she uh, she is the see prima, we don't have to worry. But if it is she she second pregnancy, then we do give that. I think uh, I will just like to intervene, uh, 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 Shashi, because this point I think Tina has already summed up very very clearly. Because ICT and Aparna also that ICT a few questions are also there. First of all, uh, even in a primary gravida at first visit, we should do ICT. And today's scenario, irrespective of husband status, because we actually, a lot of issue like any relationship previously, paternity. So even if the husband is RH negative, we should do it. Then okay. we are going to do the one monthly NTD. And uh, here, uh, important thing, I think Tina and uh, Parna, uh, like everybody says that if NTD is positive, then NTD prophylaxis immunoglobulin has no role. Our road track actually changes entirely. It is okay. a when I present pregnancy and the NTD is not going to help us, but we have to monitor with the good levels of uh, ICT titer, what is happening. It is below critical level, it is above critical level and the MCA peak systolic velocity. So this is very, very important point because every time we do the panels, there is a lot of issue and I see they, so many prescriptions that NTD is positive, so it is urgent to take the NTD immunoglobulin. But actually, it is the time when we take the opinion of fetal medicine, we send the babies for the regular uh, middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity. So uh, very, very clear message to all the audience because I am seeing few questions also on that part. I think Mala and Tina, uh, we are very clear because this is a uh, like something which is uh, troubling everybody. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. So the main so confusing. So the most important yes. thing is this, that we have to prevent sensitization. First yes. pregnancy, if we act carefully, the cases of high drops and RH allergenization are going to drop. So it is the yes. first pregnancy in which we have to educate the patient and we have to educate ourselves also to get the ICT done at 28 weeks and give anti-D only if the ICT is negative. Obviously, with multiple relationships and uh, kids and, and the uh, ladies having multiple partners, you may actually need to repeat that ICT appropriately at 28 weeks. It's the responsibility of our obstetricians to get it done and give the anti-D if it is ICT negative. So the learning main learning point is that, and yes, obviously, after giving the anti-D at 28 weeks, we are not going to repeat the ICT because ICT. obviously it is going to come positive in milder dilution. One is to two, one is to four. And that's okay. That does not mean that the baby, that the mother is isoimmunized. That just means that the patient is having adequate uh, anti-D immunoglobin in her bloodstream. So therefore, there is no, no need to repeat ICT after giving anti-D. And after anti-D, Weak titers like less than one is to four dilution may persist as obviously Dr. Aparna has elaborated so nicely in her talk that we are just reiterating the fact again and again just so that we are adhering to the guidelines and obviously that is the key for the management of RH isomerization and RH negative pregnancy. In this Thanks. patient also because she was given us uh, this thing NTD because of that subchorionic hematoma, the low titer may be present at even 22 weeks yes. but that is not a contraindication to give NTD. So we have to see that also. Because yeah. you... And even in patients who are having repeated small bouts of bleeding, like, as if in placenta previa, we have to repeat ICT and then decide whether next dose of anti-D has to be given or yes. not. If the titer falls down, we Parna, have to repeat yeah. it. Yeah, Dr. Parna, clearly. Yeah, there is uh, one question uh, in chat box, a uh, question answer session, Mala, that uh, this, because you have raised this point, that what should be the interval in the recurrent bleeding of the three, NTD profile? Three weeks, so, three weeks uh, you have so. to do ICT. Every three weeks, if the 
levels fall, ICT becomes negative, then you have to repeat it. So thank you for that because there was a question. Dr. Kusum, the week away, continuing with the same patient, patient is at 32 weeks and you repeated ICT, it is positive in one is to two dilution. What to do now? We want to impress the same questions again and again so that the clear messages goes. Dr. Kusum, you're there? Yeah. Yeah, please. Patient received NTD. At 28 term. weeks, now at 32 weeks, you repeated uh -huh. ICT, it is positive, one is to two dilution. What to do now? Patient received NTD and reached the term. Then uh, during delivery, no stripping uh, of the membrane, avoid oxytocin, ARM can be done, no further pushing of the in first and second, third stage of labor, and no uterine massage, uterine grasp and squeeze in third stage. And after delivery, cord clamping should be long and delayed. The fetal uh, cord should be uh, lengthy and the cord uh, clamping should be delayed. Let the placenta be delivered spontaneously. No MRP, protect the vaginal and perineal wound and laceration from being exposed to fetal blood. You have nicely told Dr. Kusum what precautions to be taken during the uh, antenatal period, during delivery, during uh, what precautions to be taken, how to prevent isoimmunization during the intrapartum period. So any specific precautions during cesarean section? And, and during cesarean section, uh, before uh, giving lower uterine segment incision, the abdominal pack should be applied so that the uh, fetal blood doesn't enter into the peritoneal cavity. The placenta should be delivered spontaneously, and the same uh, and the uh, avoiding cutting uh, like uh, labor and the uh, uh, avoid cutting placenta. Let the placenta be delivered spontaneously using controlled traction without squeezing the uterus. So we have to take all the measures to prevent alloimmunization of the mother because we don't want mothers to get sensitized neither during the antenatal period nor during the intrapartum period. So once the yeah. baby is born, what investigation you want to do for the baby? One thing the I would like to add, Mala, because packing of the uterine pack to prevent spillage, I think uh, at every step we should be very cautious about that we are not adding to isoimmunization. So uh, the uh, like not doing MRP is the way for every cesarean section. So it should be a law. Uh, we always avoid cutting through the placenta like a good cesarean section technique. Yet, yet I will like to have opinion that abdominal pack are, are you using Mala for this thing that it is not spilled or you are just because uh, this is something that uh, that is uh, uh, additional message beyond the routine a uh, good cesarean section technique so what's your yes mala i want to have your opinion. yeah we we use abdominal packs to prevent spillage as much as possible as much as possible because we may not be able to prevent the entire spillage but as much as possible we put the abdominal packs to prevent spillage of the blood into the Just I would like to emphasize at this point that we should, when we are doing cesarean section, we should be cautious with our every step that we are not excessively handling either uterus or placenta or uh, like our procedures also unnecessarily. So even during the normal delivery also, we yes, have to yes. be careful about the episiotomy wound. Yes. Yeah. So that the contamination with the fetal blood is avoided. The mother to our positive cells should be avoided. Any exposure of mother to any because first pregnancy is the best pregnancy to prevent isoimmunization and we have to be very careful in when we are handling the first pregnancies and the primary gravidas so what investigations for the uh, newborn has to be done routinely in an rh negative mother blood group dct and cbc and bilirubin and if the baby is found to be uh, blood group RH positive and DCT negative, the mother has to be given NTD. Yes, preferably within 72 hours. Later on, the baby must be followed up with serum bilirubin on day three also, because in neonatal period, the baby may have hyperbilirubinemia. 
so anti d when and how to be given dr pramila you can take this so any any rh negative mother with a rh positive husband during the antenatal period if she has any potentially sensitizing event which has already been described i don't need to describe again the patient has to be given a dose of ntd and if there is no sensitizing event through the throughout the pregnancy the ict has to be repeated at 28 weeks and if she is still ict negative 300 microgram IC, uh, ntd has to be given there are two guidelines some people are using uh, 100 microgram at 28 weeks and then 100 at 34 weeks but we are using uh, acg AC, acoj aicg and uh, india we are using 300 microgram at 28 weeks but if the patient is already NTD positive, ICT positive, then there is no role of giving any NTD to that patient. Then the patient has to be followed up with uh, ICT titers till a critical titer is reached, that is 1 is to 16. And then once that critical titer is reached, then the patient has to be followed with PSV in middle cerebral artery and followed up and till the MC, PSV in MCA is less than one point. A five mom that has to be repeated every one or two weeks and once that uh, 1.5 mom is reached the baby has to be given uh, intrauterine transfusion if the period of gestation is less than 35 weeks and if the baby has already reached 35 weeks we need to deliver that baby yes dr pramila this was very well briefed so here again reiterating the point of what dr aparna said that we have to follow certain rules in RH negative pregnancy. Now here, what we are discussing is when to give antity and when not to give antity. So obviously, if the mother is RH negative, husband RH positive, we are doing an ICT, ICT is negative at 28 weeks, we are giving antity. This is the first point. The second scenario is when not to give antity. Obviously, if the husband is negative, we are expecting that all the childs are obviously going to be Irish negative. We are I not going to give antity. Sure. Yes. Sure. yes, I said the husband is negative. So first case, if the husband is negative, we are not going to uh, follow her for RH discordant couple or RH incompatibility. If the husband is positive, obviously we had discussed if there, if we can do heterozygosity of the father and we know that it is heterozygous, obviously through NIPT, we can know the blood group of the baby. And if it is negative, not to give antity in this pregnancy. So cell-free fetal DNA through NIPT is available. And obviously if the patient is undergoing any invasive procedure like amniocentesis or CVS during pregnancy due to other indications, other, other fetal indications, obviously remember that, that ask for the blood group of the uh, baby in that uh, pregnancy. Now, secondly, after delivery, so when to give antity after delivery? Obviously, when the blood group is negative of the baby, we are not going to give antity. If the blood group is positive of the baby, obviously, we are going to give antity in the dose of uh, 300 microgram IM into the deltoid. The second most important thing is if, suppose, during cesarean, you or, or you or you find that the mother is having massive abruption. So is that dose etiquette, 300 microgram of antity is etiquette for the mother to prevent Absolutely. sensitization. Well, so that's why, so that's why we have to remember this, that if you find this, that there is more than 30 ml of fetal hemorrhage, which is expected, get a clear hole bed kit count and then quantify your FMH and then give the antity. Now remember one thing: the studies have shown this that you can you can maximum give five vials of antity in case of in one particular case of massive abruption. Now we can't go beyond that. So that is one fact which we have to remember. So these are the summarizing points that antity has to be given and when not to be given has to be remembered. Thank okay, you. It's uh, five vials in twenty four hours. If the hemorrhage is more, you can repeat the dose after 24 hours, even if it is more than five vials. It is within first 24 hours, you can't go beyond five vials. Yes. Normally, when abruption we are expecting, we are expecting massive hemorrhage, uh, massive FMH during abruption. That's the only situation when we are expecting massive uh, fetal maternal hemorrhage. Because even in placenta previa, the, whatever the bleeding is there, it's, it's outside. There's a lesser chances of immunization. It's the uh, concealed abruption where we are very, really worried. 
and that's the place where there's a role of quantifying the fetal maternal hemorrhage so we move on further experience of giving iv uh, there's a uh, immunoglobulin when we are giving on a higher doses and iv dose uh, Days, what the book there are only says. very few preparations which can be given IV. I IV. don't think that's available in India. India uh, is. This is enough Alexis also. Right, right. So we move further, Dr. Pooja. Now she comes in next pregnancy in ICT positive. In spite of recommendation from immunoprophylaxis, approximately 0.1 to 0.4 percent of women at risk will become sensitized during pregnancy. So this patient has come in next pregnancy and she's ICT positive. What other tests you would like to do and how to approach Dr. Pooja? Uh, so ma'am, uh, now we uh, know that this ICT is positive and we look for the titers. Uh, and uh, if it is more than one is to 16, uh, then we have to monitor these ICT titers every four weeks till 28 weeks and then every two weeks if this titer does not reach a critical level then we can deliver safely if it is more if it reaches more the critical titer then we have to start monitoring for fetal anemia using ultrasound guided adopters mca psv is to be done and uh, where uh, wherever feasible like in my setup we can't do it but wherever feasible cell-free dna will tell us the fetal blood grouping and we can ascertain um, the paternal zygosity accordingly. So when the one question comes that in case, in case the ICT titers are rising, then, uh, then why do we need all these fetal blood group DNAs and all? Because that per, per se says that the patient is getting aluminized again and again and the fetus is probably positive only. MC so ICT titers are rising. That's an indirect, indirect uh, inference. Yes. Yeah, so if titers are rising, ma'am, then actually the role is more of MCA PSV. Uh, guided yeah, drug. we have to monitor. Yeah. Then we don't have to go in for cell-free DNA and uh, the paternal zygosity. Yes. yes. So then we can just monitor with the MCA PSV. If it is more than one is uh, one point five uh, MOM, then we can uh, consider an IUT. And this algorithm was discussed earlier also, uh, how frequently IOT is needed to be done and we can carry on the pregnancy till 35 weeks. Dr. Kusum, what is the critical title and what is the role of uh, and its significance in the management? Critical title, title below which no uh, severe ectoblastosis or perinatal death have been observed. It is laboratory specific. It critical titer is the titer associated with the risk of development of severe anemia in hydrops at a specific institution. One is one is to sixteen or more. If it is more than one is to sixteen, then it is dangerous. Patient has to be referred to the trusty label. Doctor Pramila, what do you see now? This is the. Doppler study peaks is only velocity being taken in the middle section. Yes, so ideally the thing is this the first image here which shows the labeling here we can see that the red one above is the middle cerebral artery the second image was showing the circle of Willis and the third image is showing the power Doppler image so obviously there are certain norms in uh, how to take MCA PSV Doppler so it has to be taken appropriately and only then interpretation of the images or the PSV value has to be done. So first look at the image. The image should be zoomed. The circle of Willis should be visible. You should be able to take the angle of insonation near zero and put the power uh, Doppler in that angle and then measure the middle cerebral uh, velocity. So when you see that all the ideal condition are fulfilled, the gate velocity is 22 mm, the angle of insulation is less than 30 degree, then we insonate and then we find the middle cerebral artery velocity waveforms and the highest level at which you see the hills there, that is the peak systolic velocity. So as a subjective guide, as Dr. Aparna reiterated previously, if it is double than the gestational age, suppose the gestational age is 24 and you find it as 48, obviously you are going to look at the nomograms and then see that what the value is all about. So in next, 
the next question to dr pramila will be that what is multiples of medium or why are we looking at mca uh, middle cerebral artery psv and how does it correlate with anemia dr Pr pramila multiples of median it should be ideally first of all why do we see how does it correlate with anemia why are we looking at middle cerebral artery suddenly all of a sudden we are because, looking at middle cerebral because, artery because when the fetus becomes anemic the viscosity of the blood decreases and so the peak systolic velocity increases and the middle cerebral artery is the peak taking a peak systolic velocity in the middle cerebral artery is the easiest. So that is why we are taking the MCA PSV. And uh, if the peak is uh, if the mom A of PSV in MCA is less than one, it is okay. And between one to one point five is mild to moderate anemia. But if the level has reached more than one is to five one point five mom, that indicates severe anemia. And then there is an indication of IUT if the period of gestation is less than 35 weeks. Yes, so this chart shows the in a positively skewed distribution. Here we can see that we take the, take the median here. And when we see the median from here, we calculate the value of the uh, MCA PSV and then correlate it with multiples of median. So see 1.29, 1.15, 1.13 mom is mild to moderate anemia and the baby is able to handle it in, uh, in, in, in utero gestation. Mm -hmm. But once it crosses 1.5 mom, obviously this corroborates to severe anemia and the baby requires intervention in the form of transfusion. And the transfusion during pregnancy to the fetus is known as intrauterine transfusion. At this moment, I will like to have Tina because a little bit I will be presenting the average clinician perspective. So uh, two things about it that uh, uh, MCA PSV, what the FIGO recommendation, especially on IUG or something, FIGO not recommendation concern uh, that availability of expertise in many resource countries and the uh, inter and intra observer variation. So one message which I want to give because correct angle Doppler studies varies very widely. Again, if you have a wrong isolation angle, if you have the wrong putting of probe. So one message to everyone that if it is RS negative pregnancy, ICT is becoming positive, 1 is to 8, 1 is to 16, that send the person to a good expert person because it is something which uh, inter and intra observer variation because FIGO is concerned that we have a lot of it. I have one question to you that about fetal tachycardia. As a sign of anemia, we find it is RH negative pregnancy and fetal heart rate is coming 160, 170. Does it have any implication for uh, like pointing to diagnosis of fetal anemia? As a fetal expert, I want to know from you. I know cytosism, which pattern? See, ma'am, uh, the only thing is this that uh, first of all, we have to remember this that MCA PSV is not only used in RH isomenized pregnancy, it is also used in parovirus. There are other causes of causing fetal anemia. So we have to remember that. So yes, definitely MCA PSV has a role and it has also a role in major majority role is in uh, isomenized pregnancy. But obviously sometimes we find that as a cause of non-immune hydrops fetalis, we find that torch infection, simple CMV, toxo, parvovirus, B12, even Zika, they are causing fetal anemias. And we are under, you know, uh, always we are in a dilemma that why is the fetus, fetus anemic? Despite having this, we have ruled out all the single gene disorders, even then the fetus is anemic. So this, in, you know, we have to remember this, that fetal anemia is not only caused by RH incompatibility, but there are also many other causes which may lead to hydrops and therefore it is known as non-immune. Therefore, we have categorized it as immune hydrops and non-immune hydrops. And in non-immune hydrops, the cause is uh, chromosomal disorders and second is fetal anemia caused due to infections. So we have to remember that and obviously... MCA PSV has to be done by an expert. There are specific guidelines to perform the PSV because it is very much, there has been inter-observer variations. There has been intra-observer variability also. They have to be, we, have, we have to be very cautious in doing and basically if you are able to repeat it, okay, and you find that, okay, 1.49, 1.51 mom, it is reaching, then obviously, and the baby is having ascites, the baby is having pleural effusion, obviously it needs intra transfusion. 
have to remember those are the npc and nte antigens also minor yes. antigens yes minor antigens obviously play a role and right. as dr aparna has obviously shown a miraculous uh, saving of the life intra uterine from the blood was you know taken from japan and then so we encountered but there, those are rare cases those NPC are obviously rare are cases npc is not very rare See, basically now we want to tell you something that mca mca psv the sensitivity decreases after 35 weeks that is very important point to remember so after 35 weeks you cannot follow a patient a fetal anemia with mca psv we have to take the decisions regarding termination of pregnancy so subsequent alumnized pregnancy we have a pay dr promila we have a case of bad obstetric history Six gravida, para four, living zero, and A one. First pay, first pregnancy, neonatal jaundice, baby expired at day three. Second pregnancy, missed miscarriage at ten weeks. Third pregnancy, IUD at thirty four weeks. Fourth pregnancy, hydrops vitalis at thirty two weeks, IUD. Fifth pregnancy, twenty eight weeks, hydrops vitalis. Sixth present uh, pregnancy, patient presents at ten weeks. Now, how do you proceed, Doctor Promila? so i would like to take a detailed history of this patient also whether in the first pregnancy where did she deliver and whether the her blood group was done or not a baby's blood group was done or not and uh, uh, we have to investigate what for other uh, causes of bad obstetric history also because she had a missed abortion at 10 weeks and then iud if the detailed workup was done or not besides that Uh, the first and foremost is i have to know the blood group of the patient and the husband and uh, if the patient is rh negative uh, and the husband is rh positive i would like to do a icd titer for her and uh, since she is having a, a pregnancy losses in early next pregnancy it is as it is always expected in rh uh, in isoimmunization the losses and the hydrops occurs at a earlier gestation because of the amnestic response of the mother so baseline icd i have to get it done and if the baseline icd is very high then there is a role of iv ig and plasma exchange also because we cannot do a iut before 18 weeks so uh, there there have been studies that the iv ig uh, delays the uh, in, increase in isomerization of the baby hemolysis in the baby by about 25 days and uh, if it is still high then the plasma exchange can also be done and then we will start doing the peak systolic velocity in mca starting at 16 weeks and uh, uh, then follow it up according to the first report and if the if it is less than 1.5 mom then we will repeat it every 2 to 4 weeks depending on the report and after 28 weeks we have to repeat it because she already had an iud at 28 weeks so it is expected that she will have a, a mom of more than 1.5 earlier at around 24 or 26 weeks and once that titer one the once that psv mom reaches 1.5 we have to take a decision for intra uterine transfusion to prevent that bad outcome as in the past pregnancy and there is no role of giving any ntd in this patient so she is already isoimmunized very nice to summarize dr prabhu the baby after delivery baby after delivery has to be strictly monitored baseline test of blood group then uh, a, a cbc and serum bilirubin and dct have to be done and the baby has to be strictly monitored for neonatal jaundice and the phototherapy started as early as possible and the, still the baby may require exchange transfusion only if the baby is rh positive dr monica can you throw a light on the iut now dr promila has discussed about the incidence of iut what are the indications of iut when the intrauterine transfusion is done when the mcv psv is more than 1.5 we can start with as early as 26 weeks when the hematocrit level is less than 25% and if hematocrit level is less is up after 30 26 weeks it should be more than 30 and we should always give a uh, mala first we should do uh, ultrasound we should know the position of the baby whether we are it is what is the lie of the patient, baby what is the heart rate and other investigation should be done then the o negative blood should be uh, 
arranged and the proper counseling and consent taking is important. When then we then transfuse O negative leukodepleted ga gamma eradicated blood under proper antibiotic coverage and tocolysis because it can lead to many complications. So the pa patient should be under the we have, should be having all the facility to manage these cases. We should having an OT prepared for that. Fetal medicine expert should be there. And the counseling should be very proper, very accurate, because they can lead to many complications and the patient should be with us. And the dose of transfusion should be always calculated. It is final minus initial hematocrit upon hematocrit of the transfused donor into 1.046 plus effective fetal weight. And usually we transfuse 40 to 60 ml of the blood in one sitting and we can repeat it if required. And if, when after the transfusion, we just uh, take out some blood and we can now do the hematocrit level. What is the hematocrit level? And whether we will need a subsequent transfusion and we have to regularly follow up the patient. So what are the long-term or short-term outcome in children after IUT? Ma'am, after IUT, there can be a hyperbilirubinemia mm -hmm. and uh, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and mainly the baby are delivered preterm because of many complications occur. So we have the all the complications what the preterm baby is having, and there can be respiratory distress syndrome, necrotizing enterocolitis, severe cerebral injuries, neurodevelopmental effect will be there. There can be a jaundice to the patient. And if there's a more the sensitization, hydrops and other features can also be there. And we have to manage them very accurately. So we should be having a very good neonatal services with us. Dr. Tina, you wants to add something regarding IUT? Any more message you want to give? Ma'am, basically the first thing which we are, I will like to reiterate it that are uh, as a primary obstetricians, uh, I'll request them that when, once uh, there is RH isoaminized pregnancy or you find that ICT is positive, please refer to a fetal medicine cons uh, specialist. First of all, for, you have to know this, that the baby has to be followed by MCA, PSV, do Dopplers. Refer to a tertiary care center where the availability of the blood bank is there, where the availability of intrauterine transfusion is there. And then proper referral will only save the life. Once the baby receives the transfusion, only then we'll be able to save the lives. And obviously, once the baby receives intrauterine transfusion, obviously the cost is a bit high. This is an invasive procedure. It will require admission. And not once, the baby may require twice or thrice. And obviously, the last transfusion, which is done is around 34, before 35 weeks, because after 35 weeks, even if the MCA PSV, suppose you find MCA PSV at uh, 34 plus 6 as 1.49, or 35 at as 1.5, you will rather deliver the baby rather than to send it for an intrauterine transfusion. So that way we have to be very clear in our protocols that in first pregnancy, how to manage. The aim is to prevent sensitization. In first sub, uh, subsequent pregnancy or first aluminized pregnancy, how to follow it. Follow it with ICT titers and MCAPSV Dopplers. And third, if the baby is RH isoaminized, Aluminized, the MCPSV is more than 1.5. Refer to a tertiary, refer to a fetal medicine specialist who will do intrauterine transfusions. So that is the main thing which we I will like, like to reiterate. And then the procedure of intrauterine transfusion is that you require a donor. The donor hematocrit is quite high, 75 to 85. Now see, we have the hematocrit of 30. The the aim of the transfusion is what to increase the hemoglobin of the baby to at least hematocrit of 30. Now we are transfusing very high hematocrit okay so there so that the volume is less we achieve the hematocrit of 30 with less volume of maternal or you know the transfused blood is o negative gamma irradiated irradiated leukodepleted so these conditions have to be followed okay so therefore the blood bank hematologist support and obviously the tertiary care center has to be remembered so that is what it is that when we have to know what are the indications of, you know, intrauterine transfusions. Secondary, the fetal medicine expert will obviously have a multidisciplinary team. They have hematologists in their loop and therefore the blood bank and etc. Et so that way we have to know that. So this is what I like to brief. Dr. Mala? I request Dr. Sada, madam, to give her expert comments. What? Intrauterine transfusion. 
Ma'am, uh, uh, overall, we are coming to an uh, end of our panel. Uh, yes, so yes, we yes. need us expert Actually, uh, uh, yes, uh, when there is RH negative pregnancy, we have like focused the session on the RH incompatibility between mother and fetus. I think you have, uh, we have given a very, very clear message that all primary gravida, irrespective of husband status, if RH negative has to do the ICT titer and they all follow. Uh, I will go just beyond it and I was emphasizing when we were having personal talk that yes, RH incompatibility is an issue, but never forget mother because anemia is prevalent. It is around affecting 60 to 80 percent of our pregnant women and when there is a RH negative as well. Always be very, very careful for preventing anemia in that because I see so many times in me, others, that patient had the postpartum hemorrhage, patient has this complication and there was no RH negative blood available around blood bank or the issue of other things. So one thing that never forget, we have done a wonderful panel and talk on the RH incompatibility. I think still we have few questions, but I will emphasize just beyond that correct anemia, but what any way, like do good protocol for it and always think of because every pregnancy is a potential, like something okay, they can have the need of blood transfusion. So this is very important that RH negative women are special and they need to have a record of the donors who are RH negative. And the, what is the third thing, which I, I will really like to say for the RH negative uh, mothers, that what the question about carbitocin, question about active management, could you say, never do MRP, what we have done. So very, very important. It is more so important that in RH negative, we follow the active management of third stage of labor because we don't afford to have the postpartum hemorrhage in RH negative women. So this is beyond because yes, fetus is always important. It is a very, very good now, a very, very uniform protocol for us. And we have now, uh, fortunately, that we have a good fetal medicine, if not in our, uh, like, if not in immediate our city, like we have the from Alvar people, Monica's, but we can always have a good referral to our adjacent people. So this uh, communication should be there. And I will say to all experts that they should also always honor every referral also so that uh, the patient are not lost because it is beyond technicality. Actually, we as a now today's medicine, we have a very, very good knowledge of the technicality, but it is patient are fearful to going to like Delhi AIMS or SGPGI because they say they will be getting lost. So I always call on them. Nay, nay, I will call them. So beyond technicality, if we really want to have a good use of expertise, their services, then we must have a very, very mutual respectful, honorful communication and the feedback, what happened to them when you go to back to your obstetrician, what happened to that. So this is non-technical part is very, very important in RH negative pregnancy. So this is uh, like my, uh, like uh, the, I think I have added one or two things which we want that everybody should be very, very careful about it. Thanks madam for your expert opinion and your guidance regarding tender loving care to each and every patient that is important. Especially when the patient is RH negative, we have to take care not only for the mother as well as for the baby. And both are important equally for us. May I have some expert comment from Dr. Shashi Bala? Uh, Bala, you can stop the slide yeah. shares. That we can so just discuss. to conclude, uh, uh, we recognize presence of Dr. Alka Kuthe with us also. She is a uh, very senior. Uh, 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 and so many. Yes. <laughs> so, madam, this was a really. We don't have any fetal um, this uh, expert in our city also. So that is a big, big problem. So many things I got to learn. RH negative, so many things can be done. So it has to be on a marks and see that we give a live baby. She should not suffer. If you can't manage, you refer to a person who can do that. So, so many things. And thank you so much, Malam uh, uh, Shivasta ma'am and uh, all the speakers. I tell you, so many inroads have been made. And thanks to technology, thanks to your expertise. I feel... Uh, I'm not exactly an expert for this uh, really. Dr. Pramila, what is the last message from you? 
uh, one more most important thing is any patient going either for medical termination or surgical termination her blood group must be documented and if the husband is rh positive the ntd must be given because that is also a very very important cause of rh isoimmunization patients go uh, take over the counter medical uh, pills for the termination even in the uh, periphery the blood group is not asked when the mtp is being done so that is also very very important reason the patients are undergoing isoimmunization in the during the pregnancy uh, we take care everything but abortions are also not to be forgotten and secondly uh, as dr sadna already said ki in rh negative we have to take care of anemia even if the patient is not responding to oral iron we can give iv iron by after doing the iron studies and to be on the safer side still uh, we i always get two units of uh, rh negative blood kept cross matched in the blood bank they charge a minimal amount of money the blood is not wasted so that we don't waste time uh, in cross matching of the blood they have agreed for that because in that case in emergency if there is any problem especially if the hemoglobin is not up to the mark even if after giving iv iron or if the patient is beta thal minor in which you don't expect a hemoglobin more than 10 and in rh negative in emergency you don't get the blood so it's always safer to keep two units cross matched in the blood bank don't get the blood so that it is not wasted and in emergency that cross matching is time is saved thank you pramila wonderful dr monica your comment one comment one liner and we are in a very small city near the uh, delhi and uh, it is our pramila we are educating our patients and even the nursing staff and the working persons working in the periphery to use ntd in all the abortions they are doing because i think the uh, when the people are doing the abortion in first trimester they are not using they are not doing routinely blood group of that patient and mm -hmm. many times sensitization occur at that time yes. when the ntd is not received and the patient suffers for it so for uh, doing an abortion or taking an empty pill or whatever they are doing they should go for a blood group testing and if it negative better they should take ntd if they are not able to take in 72 hours better they should take afterwards because it is going to help somewhat if not fully but somewhat i think ki up to 28 days they can take it is one of the very very important message actually aparna was saying that incidence is going low but our sgpgi people says that incidence is going high and the rampant use of medical abortion drug without doing blood grouping and without administering ntd is one of the cause for it and one message to everybody that never prescribe anti uh, medical abortion drug without doing blood group rh typing and you have to give the ntd with the mifi just a with the mifi pistone one has to give the ntd so this is very very important message because with the like 1.4 billion population we have and a 7 to 10% rh negativity and so many like consumption of medical abortion drug this is one of the very very crucial steps to have a like a bad uh, isoimmunization any any rh negative married woman should be counseled even if she because in india even the patient can take a empty pill without prescription they show the previous prescription and take it she should be counseled that even if she goes for mtb pill on her own she needs to take a ntd injection and visit the doctor she should take it um uh, i would like to reiterate the point that the dr pramila made at the end uh, in my setup what happens is patient will uh, visit us once in our tertiary care opd and then decide not to come back again so uh, at that point of time if we are counseling them adequately about the significance of their blood group and the requirement of ntd then perhaps we can help them in the future pregnancies at the same time we also get patients who are coming at 36 weeks with high drops or 35 weeks with high drops and they don't give us time for referral or for doing uh, adequate management so it is very important that we whenever we have a point of contact with the patient even for at 10 weeks or 11 weeks with rh negative status we should be adequately counseling them so wherever they go they can seek the proper treatment be aware of uh, requirement of ntd a very important actually this is so very important that आपको ये बोलना है कि आपका डिलीवरी कहीं भी होगा डॉक्टर को याद दिला देना 
कि मेरा आरएच और मेरा ब्लड ग्रुप होना है बिकॉज समटाइम इन इमरजेंसी सिजेरियन और डिलीवरी डन एंड दे गेट डिस्चार्ज एंड दे कैम आउट विद द बेबी सो दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एट एनी पॉइंट ऑफ कांटेक्ट कि आपका ब्लड ग्रुप आरएच नेगेटिव है आप याद दिला देना कि इस बच्चे का ब्लड ग्रुप टेस्ट के लिए जाएगा सो दिस इज एंड ऑलवेज ऑन द केस शीट पुट द ब्लड ग्रुप लाइक इट शुड बी अगर कोई जना नहीं लिख रहा है ब्लड ग्रुप वहां पे कॉलम होना चाहिए सो दैट नो सिस्टर नो जूनियर डॉक्टर एक्चुअली मिसेस in all of critical emergency bp and every, everything that the blood group was oh it was rh negative and we did we come to know after that so this is a very very important uh, message and uh, uh, kusum ji is with us kusum ji your message top first prescription top left top of the first prescription yes yes generally how we do is whenever there is rh negative we have a red pop up coming in our software that it is rh negative so follow her so same thing can be applied on antenatal card you can just whenever it is rh negative just uh, make a red flag there yes. write it from the red pen so that you always remember that you have to follow her with the ict or antd has to be given dr kusum your your one liner for the delegates Ma'am, ideally, the adolescent girl should be educated about their blood group. Uh, now, at the admission time, the blood group of the kids are done in the school, but uh, the awareness about the blood group is not told to them. So, as obstetrician, it's our duty that when they are adolescent, they should be uh, told about the uh, what happens when you, when your blood group is Rh negative, because many times patient comes to us. The, the um this is the, is their first pregnancy and uh, they have um, gone for medical abortion because they don't want the issue and they don't know about their blood group and uh, they become sensitized so in my opinion every adolescent girl should be made aware of rh negative blood group Uh, that is very great and uh, uh, again i will say beyond that rh negative needs sometime as a donor also so we have to say you are special like na indra gandhi have a rh negative blood group so they are special because they might be saving lives in many situation so you are special and take care of your pregnancy and take care of your hemoglobin and so that you can donate blood whenever there is a need for the rh negative blood so it was a wonderful uh, manner wonderful and, panel yes uh, we had I from must... like ganga ram and aims to very small cities and this is the way what we are looking for as a unity excellence and service and uh, this is our aim and mission and uh, i hope mala and me uh, you with the bless like or dr sharda jain mala is our secretary general of north india gynae forum and uh, this is the way that we need to look in our professional bodies and the wonderful inputs by every panelist every panelist gave such a good uh, uh, message that we can carry forward. I I'll, I'll like to uh, have words of Mala, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we have to be aware. That is the most important thing. We are as obstetrician, we should know our subject very well. How to deal with an Rh negative patient? If we are not aware, we cannot transfer all these good things to our patient. Yes. So that is why awareness among obstetrician is very important. then comes the taking care of our antenatal patient each and every patient is important we have to educate our patient right from the very beginning right from the first visit if we find that a patient is rh negative we have to counsel them we have to tell them about the sensitizing points and we have to tell them when to report to your obstetrician in case of pain abdomen in case of spotting in case of any sensitizing events that can occur to them and i must thank dr sadhna ma'am to have given me this opportunity of moderating a panel and i can thank my co moderator dr P tina verma who has really done a good job and i thank each and every panelist of us who had given a good inputs they have given a good insight and make this panel very vibrant educative and informative thank you to everyone hello also like to thank <laughs> sadhna ma'am and mala ma'am for the same it was a great discussion and i hope it has some you know utility in future we really should go ahead and look forward for such discussions thank you manna ma'am thank you manna ma'am thank you sadhna ma'am thank you mala ma'am
artiest congratulations to dr mala and dr tina for great moderation of the panel and i thank dr sadhna and dr sharda for inviting me for the panel as a panel. thank you pramila it is so good to have you and all the panelists so uh, a wonderful <laughs> discussion and uh, we are so not for uh, inviting me Thank you. you can go ahead with the vote. Thanks, thanks to thanks to all our experts. It was an excellent moderation of the panel. Very good. So uh, thanks to uh, thanks to the first the thought of uh, picking up such an important and relevant topic. Thanks to Dr. Sadna for opening up uh, such an such a vibrant topic, and it has to be a point of interest. And I would just like to add that we can educate the girls, as you said, we can make them feel special. in schools start them start it so they know that their 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 blood group is negative 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 so they start feeling very uh, conscious about it and every time they visit the doctor she let the patient come up and say okay we are there to put up those red marks and everything but let the patient uh, say that i am negative so uh, thank you dr sharda jain ma'am dr amita suneja dr aparna sharma dr mala and dr tina and esteemed panelists and experts who have done a wonderful job of giving such important and pertinent message for every gynecologist to follow and cleared so many uh, thought uh, thoughts which were confusing them so clarifications have been given and everyone has got a good take home message that every mother every woman has to know her blood group and be aware all the time save it on their phones they all have smartphones save your blood group even even if they are positive you ask them they come to you in third pregnancy they don't know their blood group so this is a this is the status of educated i am not talking about uneducated we will just go blankly sit in front of the test we don't know our we must, we must include uh, hemoglobin testing with blood group testing and if we are mukt bharat ke sath will come to know how many rh negatives are there <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> media should be used media should be used to make public awareness for yes. public yeah. awareness media yeah. has a very yeah. great role we are not one, uh, one question uh, in chat box uh, will like to answer uh, either mala or tina that if the ntd is given from the question answer box if ntd is given in first trimester then is there use of giving again ntd at 28 weeks so mala and tina you can answer and a second question is the clihor block test for dr chalappan is from uh, like bharuch and dr alka kute from amravati so it is great to have audience uh, wonderful people in audience and he says oh, what is the, which lab is doing the clihor blanket block test because uh, we did the panels and the khb test is not being done in the most of the institution as well so mala and tina you can it's answer a, it's being done in our hospital khb test is done in our hospital and once we are giving antid in the first trimester we can repeat it at 28 weeks after doing the ict if ict is 1 is to 2 positive or 1 is to 4 it will may be there but still we need to do it give it because we yes. have given in the first trimester to prevent the sensitizing event at that time but at 28 weeks because we know in the third trimester there is more incidence of fetal maternal hemorrhage so in that case we have to give prevent further sensitization so we should give it at 28 weeks as Thank well you. ipika yes you can wind up the session with your final like <laughs> thank you so much we have so many uh, gynecologists here with us and uh, uh, what a nice uh, place that we can now project our divatron which is our micronized digestron 10 ng tablet indigenized api which is also made by jackson park and indigenous formulation which has a shelf life of 36 uh, months also this divatron has been awarded avax marketing excellence award last year and it has the divatron is bioequivalent to the innovator brand uh, quality assured results ensured please go ahead and give us support for divatron thank you so much and we hope to see you again thanks bye bye good night bye and bye. goodbye bye for bye. now good night bye good for night. Now.